So today we're gonna, we have a lot of information. So what I suggest is if there's something that interests you, you write it down, because um, we're not gonna be able to go through everything super quickly. I will make the slides available. Um, and then if you have any questions, we'll try to leave time at the end. So just a little bit about me. Um, I'm a rabbi, I'm a professor. I, I teach at University of Houston. I also have my own digital marketing agency um, called Optage in Houston, Texas. Uh, that, that's my Twitter handle, best way to get a hold of me, or LinkedIn, which you can get to me at dannygavin.me. Um, I've got over nine years experience. I'm a musician, and I'm also a husband and father of four boys. So these are my boy chicks. They uh, cause me a lot of trouble, but they're really cute. Okay, so today what we're gonna talk about, first we're gonna have an intro into digital marketing. So how many of you here have your own website? And then how many ha like focus more on Amazon? Okay, so we have primarily the, the website people. So some of this might be elementary, but we are gonna have like a little bit of an intro just to get everyone onto the same page. Then we're gonna talk about keyword research, on-page factors, and duplicate content. So all the exciting things that you need to know about when it comes to optimizing your website. Things that we're not going to be talking about today, but are an important part of SEO, is external links, link building, site speed, and mobile friendliness. These are all important things, but they only gave me 40 minutes. I asked for two hours, but they, they didn't offer to give it. So um, this will be for another time. OK, so an introduction. Today, the goal of marketing is to get found by customers when they're looking, not get in their face when they're not. Traditionally, marketing was all about advertisements, interrupting people, whether it's um, you know, Super Bowl commercials, it's billboards. We're in a mode where we're not actually buying, but it's interrupting. Came along the internet, and it allowed us to be in front of people at the time when they actually wanted something. I want to buy a new pair of shoes, I go online, and I look for a company that sells good shoes. So marketing needs to adapt. Um, it doesn't mean that you when it, it doesn't mean that you throw away the traditional marketing. I always tell people that marketing is kind of like investing in the stock market. Too too loud. A little way. Sorry. Okay. So uh, it's it's like investing in the stock market. It's just like in the stock market, you're not going to want to invest all in one area. You're going to spread it out between different stocks. The same thing is with with marketing. To put all your money into SEO, to put all your money into Google Ads would be silly because often things change and your strategies have to change. Um, but in, in general, like we know that online marketing has a much higher rate, it's more of an open playing field and it's permission based. People, you're, you're speaking to people when they want to be spoken to, you're not interrupting them. So now moving into search, specifically search. It's not about what you're offering but it's about what people are searching for. And this is very hard for businesses. So the muscle or parable that I like to give is, is how many of you are familiar with the company Coca-Cola? Some of us. I guess the ones who didn't raise, they have no clue. It's kind of interesting. But the idea is that imagine Coca-Cola, they put $2 billion into their website, but they forget that a certain um, part of the country, they don't refer to Coca-Cola as Coke, but they refer to it as pop. So what happens when that guy in, a, in his college dorm in Chicago is searching for the best pop drink? Is Coca-Cola's website going to show up? What's the answer? So the, it's just a muscle, and the idea is, is that um, Google's much smarter than that. They can figure it out. But it gives you an idea that businesses are so often in their own head. We know what our product is. We know what people are searching for. They forget to look at what are people searching for and making sure that those keywords and that content is found on their website. And so many people forget about that. So just to quickly clarify of what we're talking about, we all know Google, it's our friend. That's the search query when you put in the search. There's two sides of the page. There's the organic side, which is the natural listings which show up at the bottom of the page. And then there's the ads that show up at the top of the page, which as you can see right here, it takes up a lot of real estate. There's pros and cons on focusing on each area. Primarily the reason why you'd want to focus on ads is because it takes time. SEO takes time. It's like investing in real estate. You can't just turn it over quickly. But the idea is if you want to be at the top of Google and you want to be there right away, it's great to do ads. The downside of ads are it's a, every click costs money. And also, out of 100 times that an ad is seen, only uh, on average 2% of people actually click through. So that means if your ad is showing 100 times, only two out of the 100 are actually clicking through. Now, you can get a, and spend a lot of money that way, but if you're really looking to dominate the market, you pretty much need to be both at the top and the bottom of the page. So what is SEO, which is our main focus today? It's a process of inf influencing natural search results so that your web pages appear higher for the keywords you'd like to rank for. In other words, what it means is making it very clear to Google what your site and what your web pages are about. 
if it's very clear to Google, then when someone is searching for a red shirt and your page is about a red shirt, they'll show. But if it's messy, if Google doesn't know what you're about, then why should they show your page? Or if your page doesn't have all the information that's necessary, there's 100 other pages out there that they could choose from. So how do we do better? But it's also important. It's not a fast thing. It's not about buying keywords. It's not shady, because there's a lot of shady practices when it comes to SEO. And it's not about calling up Google and saying, hey, how can I get to the first page? And why is SEO so important? Let's look at this graph. This gives you an idea of, you can see the numbers on the bottom are the position of the page that your website would be found. So position one would mean the top, position 11 would be the bottom. On position one, you can see the click-through rate is as high as 35%, which means that when the page shows 100 times, 35 people are gonna click through. But as the position drops to two, three, four, five, you can see how that click-through rate drops down. The higher you are, the more likely people are going to click through. The lower you are, the less likely. And that difference from position one to two is a huge deal. And that's why everyone's so um, gung-ho about how do we get to the top of Google. OK, so the first part of, the of what we're going to talk about today is, is keyword research, which is really the foundation of SEO. And we're going to have some uh, cool examples and how you can actually do it yourself. So we're going to talk about conducting keyword research, choosing the right keywords, grouping keywords, and then adding contextual keywords. Keywords are the building blocks of search. Search engines keep track of websites and keyword indexes. And search engines measure how keywords are used on the page. Now, keywords are not the only way that, that search engines figure out what the page is about, but it is a very important way. OK, so how do we come up with keywords? So old school is keyword discovery, just sitting in a conference room with your um, with your employees and thinking, what do people search for? Sometimes we don't even just do the simple things of coming up with keywords. Next is, which is a really you know, basic one as well, but going to Google, typing in your keyword, and then seeing what are the suggested phrases. Google provides suggested phrases based off what people are searching for. So if you want to get an idea of related phrases to what your keywords are coming from, this is another great, great way, going to Google Suggest. Another one is, for example, typing in where should I office if I'm a startup. So you can see there's a lot of different results here. But Sometimes I can uncover questions or concepts which I didn't even know about. For example, um, there's one here on the top, on the bottom right. How important is having a physical office to a young technology startup? Now that's very different than what the question you wrote, but it gives me a whole other idea of what content I should write. So sometimes going and actually adding phrases and seeing what comes up, it will give me additional ideas of topics and content that I can write about. This is also a really good one. At the bottom of the page for Google, it shows similar searches that people have made to your search. Now, let's take this one for example. If I'm looking for the best startup incubators in Texas, because that's where I'm from, you can see here that I can get a lot of information. If I don't know anything about the cities in Texas, I can see that it mentions Austin, it mentions Houston, it mentions Dallas. I already know that the content that I should write should be around those three cities. Those three cities are where the startups are. That's what I should focus on. So this is like information at the bottom of the Google page, which you don't even think about, but it really provides you with a lot of insights of what you need to focus on. Um, that, the Google suggest, like the Google related searches at the bottom of the page, Google for a while was testing that even in the middle of the page. So for example, if you clicked on something, went to the website, and then came back to Google, Google started showing those related searches under the result itself. I don't know if they're still doing it, but this was just an example of what they were doing. Another important thing is, or another cool tool is answerthepublic.com. Anyone here use Answer the Public before? We got one guy in the back, so that's good. But what you can do here is type in a keyword, and it will show you all the questions that people have about a certain topic. So much when we deal with e-commerce, we're, so, we're thinking about our product pages and the keywords on the product pages, but we forget about all the research that people do. And what, what is the content that I should create to answer those questions that people are looking for? Because people aren't just you know, saying, I'm looking for a Samsung Galaxy 4 for the best price. But sometimes they're looking for, what would be the best cell phone for a medical doctor? And so another way of finding great topics is by using this keyword tool called, or question content tool called Answer the Public. This is a free tool called Ubersuggest. Um, there's a lot of keyword tools out there that cost money, but Ubersuggest is a free tool. And similar concept, you put in a phrase, and they will give you additional phrases that are related. And the nice thing also is it also gives you a difficulty score. We'll talk about difficulty in a little bit. But difficulty is the idea where 
how difficult or would it be for me, for my website, to show up on the first page? And we're, we're going to talk a little bit more about that. But this is another great tool, free. So you know what can beat that? Other discovery tools, you've got Search Console. I'm not going to go through all of these, but the slide will be available. But these are other cool tools that you can use for keyword research. And then other ideas of coming up with ideas for content and for keywords are these. YouTube is the number two search engine. Wouldn't it be great? Type in your phrase, see the videos that show up. So it can give you video ideas, but it can also give you ideas for content on your website. Amazon is also a great one. Type into Amazon, what are the products that come up? What are the books that are coming up? What are the different topics that people are looking for? You don't think of that as keyword and content ideas that you can place on your website. Quora is a question and answer site. You can actually do paid search on that now as well. But it's also, what are the questions that people are asking? And finally, live chat. One of the most untapped resources is how many people here have a live chat on their website? What you can do is export your, um, the transcripts. And I don't know if any of you are familiar with a word cloud, but you could upload those transcripts into your word cloud, and you can see what are the phrases and the topics that most people are using. Do I have the content on my website that take care of that? So live chat's a really good one that you don't think about. OK, so now that I have the keywords, because I've got tons of, play, you know, tons of ways to get keywords, starting from tools to many different things, which ones do I choose? How do I know? Right? This is the problem a lot of people have. So when choosing keywords, there's three essential qualities. One is high search volume, meaning people are actually searching for those keywords. Low competition means um, it would be easy to rank for it. And then finally, intent. What is the intent of behind the user when they're searching for that? And we're going to talk about each one of these factors. OK. So the, the question here is, choose the keyword with the highest search volume. The, the top one is cut off, but it says cooking. So how many people think cooking has the highest search volume, meaning most people are searching for it? And don't be afraid. You can raise your hands. OK, so we have one person cooking. What about cooking recipes? How many people? Oh, OK, and then how many people think cooking games? No hands. So we got one hand, right? So this always works every single time. If I could make money off of it, if I could be a magician, it'd be awesome. But the answer is cooking games. Why is that? Because people are gamers. I mean, that's half the time they're on their phones spending time and playing games. But what does this teach you? That if you don't do the research of what's actually behind the keyword, you might go in the wrong direction. And therefore, you have to see what's the search volume. OK? It's, a, it's an important lesson to note. OK. Next is how easy is it to compete in the search engine's results. So a lot of people look at, you know, when you go to Google, it says, oh, there are about a million results for this page. And they look at another keyword and say, there's about 2.5 million results for this page. Um, that's not a good measure. What we care about is the first page. Think of it as, in, I can give an example from Texas. In Texas, there were white-only country clubs. And if you were black or if you were Jewish, there was no way you could get into the country club back in the day. So the same thing is here. Every first page of Google is a country club. And depending on how strong your website is, that's your key on getting into that website. So you have to see, what does the neighborhood look out? Like, can I move into Flatbush, or do I have to stay somewhere else? Same concept. So how do we figure out the difficulty score when it comes to ranking? So the first way is Google has a keyword tool, which you actually have to have an AdWords account in order to use it. Um, but as you can see, it has more of a it's an average, so, so, or sorry, the competition is like high, medium, low. It's important to note that a lot of people use that as their measure of, is this a difficult keyword to rank for or an easy? And that's wrong, because the high, medium, low that Google's keyword tool provides is for a paid search perspective, not from an organic perspective. So you don't really want to use that. Um, rather, you want to use like a tool like Ubersuggest, where you can see that it has a paid difficulty, but it also has a SEO difficulty. And usually that SEO difficulty is from, a, from 0 to 100. How difficult would it be to rank for this page? And you get the most data when you've got a bunch of keywords. I've got 10 keywords. Let me look at the difficulty score of all of them, and then I can determine which is the one that I should go after. So it's more of a relative score, which you have to focus on. And here's just another example from um, Uber suggests where you click and it will actually show you all the websites that are ranking for a particular keyword and their individual difficulty scores. Keyword Finder is another tool which provides um, a difficulty score. 
And here's just, so, so for when it comes to competition, you can use Ubersuggest or KW Finder. There are also paid tools like SEMrush, Moz, and KeywordTool.io, which give you those competition metrics. And don't be scared um, about this. The idea is that you want to start small. Like, you might sell a million products, right? But focus on your top products and do it slowly. It's, this is not an all or nothing deal. A lot of people get scared, like, I don't even know how to start. But at least if you start somewhere, it's better than nowhere. Now, next is intent. And the concept is long tail keyword. Um, and the, the idea is so often, like, you know, CEOs will tell me, I want to rank one for men's jewelry. But so does everyone else want to rank for men's jewelry. And just because someone is searching for men's jewelry doesn't necessarily mean that, that they're ready to buy right now. But if they're looking for a, um, a necklace that has a gold coin on it for the best price, that phrase is a lot more clear to that they actually want to buy. So just if you look at this chart, you can see that when it comes to long tail, phrases with a lot more keywords, I would say 70 to 80% of Google searches are those phrases. So let's try to focus on the longer tail instead of the shorter tail. So let's just look at that, the benefits of targeting long tail keywords. It's less competition, but higher conversion rates than the obvious keyword phrases. It accounts for over 70% of all search queries, and they usually tend to be used by the people about to buy. Bed sheets versus bed sheets that keep you cool I'd rather rank for someone who's doing bed sheets that keep you cool. And what often you find is, is when you focus on these longer tail phrases, over time, you're going to rank for the shorter tail phrases as well. Another example that I like to give is like fishing. Would you rather go fishing with a fishing rod and get a big shark, or would you go with a big net? And with a big net, you might get a lot of little fish, but all that little fish is going to add up to a lot more than just that one shark. And that's sort of the concept. So now that I have these keywords, I know their search volume. I know their competitive score. What do I do now? Now I want to go ahead and group these keywords. Think that you'll be focusing on one product page or writing one blog post for each group. Each group should target three to five keywords, and it could be more. Sometimes you'll have 10 in a, in a group or 20. It just depends. Ideally, there should be some sort of common denominator or relationship among the keywords of each group. So, the idea here would be, where do I put these keywords? And it's really depending on the, on the intent. If it's more of an informational keyword, like what are the best flannel sheet sets, that deserves a blog post to discuss. When someone is searching for that, they want information. And hopefully, in your blog post, you're putting links to your products, and you're making it very easy for them to purchase if they want to. Or you're at least putting a retargeting pixel so that you can retarget them as they leave to get them to purchase when they're actually ready. However, when it's something that's more purchase ready, like queen size flannel sheet set, that's more about something that you're going to focus on a product page and making sure that those keywords are found in your product description. And a lot of us are so used to writing, you know, 100 word descriptions. Wouldn't it be great if we had 1,000 words for every product description? I know that's hard to reach, but that's going to set you apart. OK, the final missing piece is contextual keywords. And the idea is filling the gaps in the visitor's knowledge. How it used to be, if I, if, imagine I'm a travel agency, and I wanted to rank for the best places to visit in New York City. So a couple of years ago, you know how I ranked for that? I would take the phrase, best places to visit in New York City, and create a piece of content and put it in there like 50 times, right? But we all know that content, reading content, and it's got that keyword like a million times, doesn't work anymore. Rather, what is the point? Google understands topics and how they work. And therefore, if I want to rank for that, I really need to produce a piece of content that actually mentions the top 10 places to visit in New York City. And do you think that if you don't mention the Empire State Building, do you think your content is going to rank for that? No, it's not. Because imagine a piece of content that says the best places to New York City, and you don't even mention the Empire State Building. So it's crazy to think that that's how advanced Google is, but we have to think about it in that way. So a page about New York that doesn't mention Brooklyn or Long Island may not be very comprehensive, and Google actually understands that. So what I do is there's a tool. It's a free tool. There's a bit.ly there, um, which is a short link for IBM and LU d demo. And the idea is, is you go to a page. You find the top website that's ranking for your keyword. You take that keyword, uh, you take that website, and you put it into this tool. And what this tool does is it analyzes the page as if it was a robot. And it wants to see, what is this page even talking about? So if I'm looking for masters in marketing in Houston, Texas, so I can see that this page 
is primarily talking about Bauer MBA student, but interesting, at an 87% confidence interval, which means from a zero to 100, 100 meaning it, that's really what it's talking about, zero it's not talking about. It's talking about social media marketing. It's talking about the business community. It's talking about customer relationship management and um, different things like that. So I've uncovered these are the topics that the number one page is ranking for, or what they're covering in their piece of content. If I want to rank, I better talk about those things as well. So instead of looking at the content myself, I'm able to go ahead and use it, look at it from a computer's perspective and see what are the topics that it sees as what it's talking about. So that's basically the, the different concepts. So just as, as a rehash, we need to do keyword research. We need to find the volume of our keywords. We need to find the difficulty of our keywords. We need to focus on what the intent is. Is it more of a buying? Is it more of a informational a keyword? And we also need to find those keywords that fill in the gaps. What are the different parts of the topic that I need to include in my pages, whether it's my product page or my blog post? And this will help me optimize my pages, create blog posts, and give me an idea of what I even need to do. OK. So now we're going to veer into on-site SEO, which means actually going in and optimizing your website so that Google understands it. This is a great graph because it gives you a, a pretty decent idea of what it looks like to have a pretty optimized page. And we're going to go through each part. OK, so the first thing that we want to focus on when you're optimizing your website is your URL structure. Um, why is it important? Because your, your URL it appears in multiple locations. It's underneath the title tag on Google's search page. It's often as your link anchor text, which means you know, if someone's linking to you, they'll often use the URL itself. It's in the web browser bar. So the idea is that a, a URL should be relative of your page's content. A shorter URL is much better. Keyword use is important, but you don't want to stuff it. I know there was a web development company in Houston, and they used to have URLs like this. Uh, www.softwaysolutions.com slash web development slash Houston slash Texas slash US slash UK, right? They like stuffed a million keywords into the URL, which is ridiculous. So you want to put your keywords in there, but you don't want to overdo it. You want to try avoiding symbols or numbers. A lot of e-commerce platforms, by default, they don't give you SEO-friendly URLs. So you'll have like www.aol.com slash 12345. You really want to make sure that you're actually using text in your URLs. And you want to use hyphens to separate keywords, not underscores. A lot of people have that issue in their e-commerce platforms. And underscores where the line is at the bottom, a hyphen is in the middle. And the reason is because when you put a hyphen, Google understands that it's two separate words. When you put a hyphen, it's actually make it into one word. So if you have red shoes, Google understands it's red and shoes. If you have a hyphen, it would be red hyphen shoes, which is not really anything. Next, title tags. It's an accurate, concise description of a page's content. It's critical for the searcher and for the search engine. So the title is, it shows up in the web bar on top for some browsers. And then it's also what shows up on Google, right? So you want to include keywords. The search engine only displays about 50 to 60 characters. You want to include your brand if possible, but never put it at the beginning of the title. You always want to stick it at the end. And it should be descriptive and readable. All of these meta tags that we're talking about, you have to think of them as advertisements. Because when there's a page of Google and 10 listings, why does someone want to click on mine over someone else's? So the title is key, right? What's going to make them want to go forward? So a good example is to pump up your titles. These are good words that you can add to your titles to make them more flashy so that people will actually want to click on them. Guide, awesome, new, fast, crazy, how to, research, proven, results, amazing, step by step. Instead of just saying, men's watch, red, yellow, $500, right? Like, OK. But if I can pump it up and make people really want to click on it, that just helps me even more. And the idea is, why is this important? Because in Google, there's a concept of pogo sticking. What that means is, if you're at the top of the page, Google expects that you should get a certain amount of people to click on your page. And they go to your website, and they stay on your website. But if someone goes to your website through Google, goes to the site, and then comes back to Google, Google can realize that, hey, I don't know why I just put that page as position one. People don't really like it. And therefore, they will drop it down to position two or three. So you want to have a, you, number one, you want to try to get people to click on. And if they do click on, how do I make sure that they don't go back to Google, but they actually go from the page and keep moving onto the next page? Something we have to think about. 
Okay, meta descriptions. It's not used for rankings, because a lot of people stuff keywords with meta descriptions, but they are displayed on the search engine results page. And you can see that um, on the bottom, under the URL, that is what the meta description is. Ideally, it should be 155 to 160 characters, 290 the most. The reason why you want to do 155 to 160, because after 160 gets chopped off. You want to think of it as a headline, can be promotional. Like I know um, certain e-commerce people, they'll actually put like their sales in their descriptions. So they'll have their programmer set up that we have a little um, area in the back end where we can type in our promotion, and then that promotion shows up in every single meta description. Some people do that. Um, it could answer a question. So the idea is think about how do I get people to click to go forward. Body copy. Ideally, you want to have a 1,000 or more words on your page. And I know that sounds crazy, because it's impossible. Not, you can't always do that. But the idea is, how can we beef it up? And we can get there by having a, 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 a good product description. The key features, the benefits, customer reviews, and frequently asked questions. <coughs> so it's not always the product description. But if I can add many opportunities for content on the, on the page, I can really get up to that 1,000 number. And you'll see Google favors pages with more content than less. So you don't want to keyword stuff. Thin content is really bad. That means if you have a two-line description, really bad. Because in Google's eyes, if I've got a pr product A with a two-line description and product B with a two-line description, they may even think of that as duplicate content because it doesn't even have any content. And then a manufacturer's description is a big no-no. If you are selling or drop shipping or using, if you use the manufacturer's description, that's like death for SEO because there's a hundred other sites out there that use that description. There's no reason why Google's going to want to show your page. So yes, it does require a little bit of an investment, but you do have to do it. Rich snippets. So rich snippets are those additional cool things that show up. Um, the way you do it is primarily through code. And I'm going to use an example here just so that you can give an example. Um, so this website, uh, you can see it has a, pro a product page. And you see it's got stars, it's got different pricing, many different things there. But when you see the, the it, this is called schema. Schema.org is basically coding in the back end to let Google easily know where the price is, where the color is, where there are the reviews. And you can see that before they did anything, they're not really getting much information off the page because they didn't program it accordingly. You can see these are all the different types of schema or code that you could send to Google. And you can see there's a lot of X's and there's a lot of optional things that they don't have filled in. Very little. Um, this would be just for reviews. Um, so that's just an example where, where, where schema, once again, and you'd have to speak to your developer, marking up the page so that all the information is very clear to Google, because then Google knows, oh, you've got a five-star review because you tagged it as this is a review. Then on actually Google, when I have my product, the five-star review will actually show up. And that's so much better, because if you've got 10 products on Google and one has a five-star review, you're, you're, someone's going to more likely click on you, even if you're at position five at the middle of the page. Is everyone following so far? I know it's a lot, but OK, good. Image optimization. This is an important one. And that means the images that you upload to your site. Number one is the file name. I never want to see an image that was like abcd123.jpg. No, even the file name itself needs to be the product when you upload it. Okay. Number two is alt text. The alt text is the hidden text that describes the image. It was initially made for people who are visually impaired. So if there was a reader reading the page, it would be able to describe the image. But this is a way that you can describe to Google what the image is about. Google's very close to figuring out what images are, but they're not there yet. So you kind of have to tell them what it is. If you are targeting keywords on a page, make sure the keywords are in that alt text as well. The title tag is a separate tag for an image. That's whenever you hover over an image. There's some text that pops up. That's the title tag as well. That should also be optimized. And finally, scaling. Scaling is, is, is related to um, site speed. But the idea is, is that an image that's 10,000 by 10,000 pixels, and then it really only shows up 500 by 500, that takes the time for the page to load and actually take that image and decrease it. You want to make sure that you can go ahead and upload images at the scale that they should be. Um, if anyone has WordPress, WordPress has a cool plugin where you could just go in and automatically it takes all your images and rescales them. For other platforms, there's other things you have to do, but that's an important thing to think about. Internal linking is a very powerful way to help your website. Internal linking means the links from one page to the next. Often we just think about 
you know, I've got my top navigation, people are clicking through and they go to the products. But it's important to have links going from one page to the next, one topic from the next, especially when you have blog posts. I don't have a blog post, I'm linking to the product pages. So why are this so important? Because when you link your site, Google has a better idea of what everything is about. And if you um, have a, like, you know, um, let's say gold jewelry, you have that link and it's on a bunch of pages and it's pointing to this one page about gold jewelry, that actually sends signs to Google that this page should rank for gold jewelry. So the other ways that you can have internal linking is through breadcrumbs, which is usually the links at the top of a page, which show you where you are in the category or subcategory, related products helps, related categories. In your description itself, some people forget, I could actually have a description where it's like, oh, other options are matching jewelry, or if you like this piece, try something else. Find opportunities to internal link. And the idea is it also allows the juice to flow. Um, ju juice is referred to sort of like the link juice or the ability that people have. That goes in and it goes throughout all the different pages. The more links you have, the better you spread out this juice. You have the, the most SEO power or juice you have is at the home page. And if you want to make sure if that juice actually gets spread out throughout your site, you have to create links that link the products between each other. So therefore, every element counts. Does the title match what searchers want? Does the URL seem compelling? Do you, does, do you get the brand drop down? That doesn't always happen. Um, if you're, is your result fresh? Do you searchers want a newer result? This is an important one. Imagine if you have a blog post that did really well, but you published it in 2013, and you rank you know, three on Google, but suddenly your competitors just put a new blog post in 2019. You know yourselves, if you go to Google and you see there's two pieces of content, what would you rather click on? A blog post from 2013 or 2019? So something that people even forget about is going into your old blog posts that did well, updating them a bit, and republishing them for today's day. I actually did one last night. But you have to, and it's kind of like we think that, oh, set it and forget it. It's not set it and forget it, because even that date in there is going to make a big difference. And then does the description create curiosity and entice a click? And do searchers recognize and want to clink your domain? Do people know about your brand? OK. So we've gone through two of our sections. Now we're going to talk about duplicate content. And the reason we're going to talk about duplicate content is because it's a serious issue that a lot of e-commerce websites, especially those people who have Magento platforms, naturally causes many duplicate content issues if you don't know what to do. So this is uh, pay attention, because it's important. OK, what is duplicate content? It's when two or more pages, or really URLs, share the same content. Think of it as the URL, not the page. So that means if I can get to this one page through different URLs, in Google's eyes, that can be considered duplicate content. And we're going to give many examples, so you'll get to see what I mean. It's often unintentional, especially when you're coming to dynamic websites. And the history is, Think of it as, you know, where did duplicate content even start? You know, uh, my family ha has started an e-commerce website in, 20, in uh, 1999. And at that time, I think they set up like five different websites for the same thing. They had uh, Loose Diamonds Houston, Wholesale Diamonds Houston, crazy, right? But that's what you could do. But then Google realized, oh, this website and that website, it's all the same website. Um, we're not going to show all of them. We'll maybe show one. So. Think about it as Google is, is essentially a spider. It sends a spider to your website, and it's going and searching the pages, reading what each page is about. So imagine if it goes to one page, great, great page. Then it goes to the next page and it says, this second page is very similar to the first page. And then it goes to another page, and it's like, oh, this page is very similar to that page. It looks like that everything here is kind of similar. I'm going to leave now. And what that means is you could have 10,000 pages, but Google's only looked at five of them because it's duplicate. So that's what can happen, right? There's also penalties involved where sometimes um, if you have very thin content, Google, um, that was called the Panda update, where it actually penalized sites when you had duplicate content and actually threw you lower on the search engine rankings. But that's what crawl budget and indexation cap is. The spider is going to only have so much patience, and you've got to wor worry about that. And that's the Panda penalty, where there's even penalties that are involved. There's three broad categories when it comes to duplicate content. There's true duplicates, same content and same domain, which means on the same website, you got the same content. There's near duplicates, which means almost the same content and the same domain. A good example would be a red iPod and a yellow iPod. If you have two pages on your website for the red iPod and the yellow iPod, 
How often do you think that those descriptions are going to be different? Not very different. So that's kind of similar, right? Could be an issue. And then there's cross-domain duplicates where two different websites and there's different content. And all of these are duplicates that we have to deal with. So how do we fix duplicates? So I've given you a nice little way to remember, 2RBC, um, which stands for Remove, Redirect, Block, and Clarify. And we're going to first go through the fixes of what can I do to fix, and then I'm going to go through examples of the issues. So you first, the solution, and then the problem, and then hopefully you'll understand it a little bit better. OK. So the first way is remove. If you've got, a, um, do, if you've got duplicate content that's a problem, you want to remove that page. What happens when you remove a page? Ideally, you want to have a 404 page. How many of you are familiar with 404 pages? Right, it basically means this page is not found anymore. And a lot of people don't take advantage of the 404 page. You can do some funny things with 404 pages. But you can also have a search bar on there, you know, products that are related, many things that you can do. But one way to take care of content is have a 404 page. The best thing to do really is to redirect, which we're going to talk about soon, to a different place. But 404 is something that we have to think about. Um, and, but, but ideally, you want to redirect, which we'll go to the next one. The next one is a 301 redirect. 301 redirect is a way that if your page does not exist anymore, <coughs> you tell the server that this page doesn't exist, let me now send them to somewhere else. Now, why do you want to redirect a page? Like, think about it. I had a product. I don't sell it anymore. Like, what's the big deal? And the idea is two. Number one is user experience. If a person is coming to my site and the product doesn't exist anymore, and more often than not, they're just going to leave the website, right? But if you can redirect them to a similar product, or at least to the category page, that experience is going to be so much better. The other one is important is link juice, which means if there were any links going into my website to that product, and now that page doesn't exist, think of it as taking water with a cup and pouring it on the floor, right? That's a big issue. All that juice, all that power that I'm getting is on the floor. However, if I redirect it, if I'm a plumber, and I create a pipe to a different page, then that juice is going to be spread to somewhere else. And that's why it's really important. Another time that 301 redirects is used is um, with site, right? If you move from one platform to the next, you want to make sure that you're redirecting your old URLs to the new URLs, something people don't think about always. Next one is block. There's a file called the robots.txt file where you can actually tell Google Spider where they can and where they can't go. So let's say I created a path on my site for doctors. And I made a path on the website for lawyers. And the content on those two are very similar. But I only really need the one for doctors to show up on Google. I could then block the spider from even going to my page about lawyers. The next thing is similar to the robots.txt, which is a main file. There's meta robots files, which are a little tag that I can stick on a page that says, do not index. So even though the spider sees it, I tell Sp Mr. Spider, please, Mr. Spider, do not index this. Forget about it. Now, the most powerful thing, and what is suggested in many ways, is called the canonical tag. And what the canonical tag basically does is it's a signpost. And it says, although, Mr. Google, the URL at the top of the browser is so-and-so, but I want you to consider this page as if it's part of a different page. So imagine you have two very similar pages. I can tell Google that page number two should really, it's connected to page number one, and therefore don't consider it as two pages, consider it as one page. So the example would be if I have uh, ecommerceshop.com slash refrigerator slash red, and then I have refrigerator slash blue, refrigerator slash green. Instead of telling them, hey, there's three different pages, really group up all the power of these pages all to just slash refrigerator. And you can actually tell Google what to consider when you've got multiple pages and a very similar, what is the main page that they should con consider? And often we have, we have, we have very, very, a lot of variance on a product. This is something that you have to do. OK, so now that we've talked about the fixes of what you do for duplicate content, let's talk about the examples of where you can have duplicate content. The first one is a very um, one that's kind of obvious, but no one really knows about it. You ever notice how sometimes you can get to your website, www, and sometimes without the www? Did you ever think that it was an issue? No, not really, right? Well, maybe, right? We got one person there. He's like, yeah, I know that issue. But the idea is, once again, this is two URLs 
that are going to the same exact page. In Google's eyes, you have two different websites. So all the power is spread into two areas. Um, it's pretty crazy, right? So what you want to do is you want to make sure that you redirect to one version. There's no right way. It could be either choose the www, choose the not www, but pushing everything to the one version, that is going to help you, OK? The next one, staging servers. Often, we're building a new website. Or <coughs> even if we're not building a new website, we're, uh, we're, where we make our changes on a staging site, and then we go ahead and we move to the live site. I've happened, I've seen, where people's staging sites get indexed by Google. So Google actually finds them. So what you do now is I can see uh, staging.com and example.com. So you have two websites out there with the exact same content, both being picked up by Google, which is a huge issue. So you want to make sure that your staging site is blocked off from Google. How do you do that? In the robot.txt file, that main file, you're, you're saying, Mr. Google, Mr. Spider, please don't come here. Don't look at it. But what you do have to keep in mind is when you push the site live, make sure to remove that file. I don't want to tell you how many sites I've seen where they're like, we don't get any traffic. And you know why? Because they're blocking Google from coming there. It's pretty crazy, but it does happen. Duplicate paths. This is something which you see in Magento and some other sites where a product is found in multiple categories. So I can get to the iPad 2 through electronics, through Apple, or through tag favorites, iPad 2. What's the problem here, guys? <coughs> Everyone is so shy. In New York, you're supposed to be boisterous, right? I'm, I'm, I'm not impressed. But s say it again. Duplicate pages. Uh, yes, but you kind of just read it. What I wanted to hear is different URLs going to the same page. It's not really duplicate pages. It's the same page. But the problem is there's different URLs for the same page. And we have to make sure to clarify to Google, what is the main URL? Or do I want to block the other ones? Do I want to simplify to make sure that I only have one path? These are things you have to think about and ways to fix your website. But we don't think about this. So, I mean, one way is to simplify your URLs, where don't even use the category in your URLs. But there's pros and cons of doing that. You could do the canonical, where choose the one version that you want to show up, and that, and that will be the one. You could block. So I personally think about using the canonical in the correct way and in the proper way. You've got to be careful how you do it. But either canonical or just simplify your URL structure so that you don't have to have all the categories show up. But once again, there's pros and cons with that. And if anyone has questions, they can always ask me. Search sorts or filters is another important one. We don't even think about this. But once again, two URLs that pretty much go to the same page. And if Google is indexing both of them, we've got duplicate content. So once again, canonical tag would be important here. What would my canonical tag be for the one on top? I would say, hey, Mr. Google, I want this to be double.example.com, search.php, question mark, keyword equals iPad, right? So therefore, if you had sort descending, um, it would know, ah, don't worry about it. The real, key, the real URL is keyword equals iPad. Now, when it comes to site search, uh, there's a whole other conversation of should I let my search pages actually index in Google? Something to think about. But theoretically, this is the idea where if you've got two URLs, we need to find a way to clarify or to redirect or to block with Google. Here's that variation which we were talking about. You've got your iPod Nano, blue, red, and the URL actually changes when you look at the different colors. Now, if your descriptions are really that different, then you don't have a problem. But most of the time, it's pretty much the same thing. And therefore, you have to make sure that you are, here would be a good example, the canonical tag, to make sure that what Google sees, that tag on all three pages says double.example.com slash product slash iPod slash Nano, even though the URL says blue, but really, where does it belong to? Just Dash, uh, slash iPod slash nano. Search pagination is another one um, where you've got page one, page two. When it comes to search pagination, there's some other tags as well. But once again, the same concept where you've got similar content, you need to make sure that you take care of it. And here is, here is the other sort of tag um, that you have, but it's called the relationship preview and relationship next. <coughs> And the concept here is you let Google know that this is a page in a series of page, pages. 
even though we're on page two, but there's a page one before it, and there's a page three after it. So please think of this as one huge page, not as 10 separate pages. Um, that's one way of dealing with it. Other ways of dealing with it are people will, instead of having paginated, they'll have one page that shows all the products on one page, and then they'll just make sure that the canonical tag focuses on that one page with all the products. So that is the presentation for today. Um, I hope you enjoyed it, want to learn more, but please don't, please don't walk away because we are gonna be doing questions and I think the questions will be even better than the presentation. Um, these are just some of the clients we've worked with, Soft Cell, and these are the services we have, um, but I'm here for answering questions and different things like that. I wanna thank you very much. Let's open it to questions about your website. Sure. Yes, I don't like to oversell, but yes. Yeah. Go ahead. Good question. Uh, okay. So if you have like keywords in your Instagram and your Instagram is linked to your website, is it catching those keywords in the Instagram post or not? So the question is if you have if you're using keywords in your Instagram posts is that going to help your website? So the answer is those are really like two different platforms. So yes, it's important to use keywords in your Instagram so that people on Instagram find it, but there's really going to be no relationship where if I use keywords in my Instagram, my website will now rank for those keywords. They're pretty much two separate platforms. No, but what if the Instagram's on your website? Oh, if the Instagram's on your website. So more often than not, when you use a plugin for Instagram on the website, you're using like an iframe. And an iframe means, think of it as like you're putting a bowl on the table and you're putting an apple in the bowl. And then the spider's running across the table. The spider can't go into the bowl and see the apple. They just see that there's a bowl there. The same concept where they see that there's something there, but they can't really read what it is. So if you can find a way to actually embed the content so that the spider can read it, then that, yeah, that's a cool way of adding content. But more often than not, those plugins are using iframes where Google doesn't really see them. Uh, exactly. Ideally, if, if, if you're an organized blogger, for every uh, you know, in, Instagram post that you have, ideally you'll have a blog post that's related to it so that you can focus on it in, in that way. Any other questions? All right, we'll, we'll, we'll go here and then we'll come to you next. Yes? Sure. So the question is, doing paid ads on Google, like we showed at the beginning, how does that affect your organic rankings, and then vice versa? If you're doing well in organic, how will that affect paid? So it's a known fact that there really is no direct relationship. You could spend a million dollars on ads a year, but that doesn't mean that you're gonna do well with organic. It's clearly stated. However, there are studies that show that when you have both, when you're, when you're viewable on the ad and on the organic, you often do better. You get what I'm saying? Now, it's not going to cause you to rank better, but if people see your brand here and there, it's more likely that they're actually going to click through and move forward. Okay? So I hope that answered. There was a question in the back. Can you talk a little more about uh, keyword grouping and maybe some of the methods you use, like keyword topic, uh, topic grouping? Sure. So when it comes to the, the question is keyword grouping, talk a little bit more about how you group keywords. So. Um, there's two ways. Number one is, think of it as a product, right? What are all the different, sort of like um, red, uh, let's see, jewelry with men's jewelry with, with, with uh, I'm trying to think. So the, the idea is you want to find a, a common phrase that is shared among the different keywords, and that's one way of grouping, so that you have the main phrase, and then what are all the adjectives or descriptors that are gonna be added to that? And then you get a really good idea of this topic in general, what are all the different phrases they use. The other way is doing the grouping like I showed near the end about the content, that when it comes to a certain topic, what are all the different aspects that I need to discuss with this product um, in order to make sure that I'm really comprehensive when I'm talking about it? So for example, if I'm speaking about a mattress and I don't say, you know, how well of a night's sleep that I'm going to have, then, uh, you know, most probably I, I, Google's going to ding me on that point because my c content is not comprehensive. So there's two ways to group. One is a similar keyword, putting that together, but then also creating a group 
in order to cover the context of that topic in complete. And by using the tools that I showed you, you'll be able to come up with all the different concepts and insights and be able to break them up into smaller groups. I hope that helped. Um, I do have some other like examples, visual examples, which I could show you if you'd be interested, I could send you. Any other questions? All right, well, it's been a pleasure. Uh, if anyone has any private questions that they want to ask, you can definitely come up to the front and let me know.